Hey guys, this is Evan from PC Gamer. So we're lucky enough to have Ian Hargingham here from Mode 7 Games visiting us from the UK in our office today. And Ian, you guys just announced Frozen Endzone, your next game, with us last week on our, our website. That's right. Uh, how has it been received so far? Yeah, we've had a, a great response. Um, we've had Frozen Endzone is a, a follow-up of sorts to Frozen Synapse. It's a sort of tactical, simultaneous turn-based game. It's the same kind of game. But rather than being men with guns, it's big robots playing a game that looks a bit like American football. Uh, so we've had a lot of people who have been sort of surprised by that. Uh, that's not what they were expecting. Maybe they were expecting a sequel. Uh, and a lot of people who think it looks amazing. So we, uh, we've been talking to everyone. Uh, we've had some, some new problems and some things that we thought would be a problem that have turned out really well. Um, and the main thing is just the amount of coverage we've managed to get um, being a small indie company. Uh, we started 10 years ago, and there was no one who would cover us. But we announced the game, and you guys um, got an exclusive. And everyone thinks it's really exciting. So it's just great how far the indie games have, have come in terms of coverage. So what's appealing to you guys about this mixture you're creating between turn-based strategy and sports? Um, it's always been appealing to me, the idea of having a sports game, something like soccer or American football, but where you have time to really make the the tactical decisions that you, you want to see in a, in a game. Um, something like Madden, uh, when you can design your own plays, one of the things which frustrates me is that it doesn't really seem to make any difference. Um, all of the good plays have been designed already for an American football game. Uh, and I really wanted to make a game which was as sort of deep and tactical as Frozen Synapse, but had the football feeling to it. And I think the idea of trying to get a ball from one end of the end of the, the field to the other is a really interesting like game type idea. So yeah, I just think, feel like it hasn't been done enough, and uh, it was a cool thing to explore. So with the sort of fundamental difference in the game in terms of your, your goals as a player, shifting from knocking out other players to you know, moving something from point A to point B, is there sort of more of a focus on territory control? How does the game feel differently, even though it's sort of transitioning? some of the same mechanics. That's right. I mean, I think um, the really successful game modes in Frozen Synapse were less about killing enemies and more about territory control. Um, so while you had the base game mode extermination, which was about just killing the other team, most of them really were about defending or capturing an area or controlling certain areas. Um, so it's kind of a natural evolution. And it makes it's even more attractive to me because you know, I think a game should have a really individual goal. And trying to kill more people in a certain time than your opponent does is kind of a, it's kind of a weird, it doesn't make enough sense to me. I think if you have a load of pieces and you've got to get just the ball from one end to the other, that's such a, a simple goal. And then you can really be creative around that. So actually, I think it's much more of an evolution of Frozen Synapse than a lot of people would, would think when looking at it straight away. And I believe that what will happen when people start to play it is that they will say, wow, this is actually a lot more like playing Frozen Science than I thought. Curious how much symmetry there's going to be in sort of the, the play calling aspects of, the, of Frozen Endzone. I mean, am I going to be able to do a reverse? Am I going to be able to do a play action? Um, or, or is it really sort of a, a more loose metaphor with football? Um, so the main thing is that the rules are really very simple. So there is not a play action button or a reverse button. Um, you are simply moving your people around at certain times. And everything about <coughs> where they are and how you are moving them then defines how much strength they have and how much ability they have to control an area. Um, so you're making conscious decisions like, if I keep my guy here, he's well established and he can block this area. If I move him, I may be able to move him somewhere better. But while he's moving, he's more vulnerable, that kind of thing. So these things are very simple rules, just like Frozen Synapse had simple rules of lines of sight and cover. Um, that you then can be as creative with as you like. So we don't have a blitz button, but it's perfectly natural to blitz the quarterback. Um, one of the rules that I'm really proud of in Frozen Endzone is that the, the length of the first turn is decided by the offense team. So I can have a very, very quick first turn, somewhat analogous to a three-step drop, which could only last like half a second. Or I can have a three-second first turn, something akin to the quarterback dropping back and then rolling out maybe which gives my receivers more time to get in position and more time to confuse the defense. But again, it's all about, does the defense realize that I'm going to do that, predict that I'm going to do that? 
if they send blitzers, then it's going to be worse if I chose the longer first turn, that kind of thing. So again, the, the real key is there are no, there are no buttons. These, these features sort of emerge from the simple rules. They're not something that we're trying to ape. But there's running and throwing. That's, that's sort of that's the, right. the base set. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how any individual person would say it was similar to football. Some people would say it's nothing like football because it has terrain on the field and it's only five against five and this, that, and the other. And some people would say it's completely like football because you have running and throwing. It's all about people's perceptions. Like when you, you can get people who will say that two games that I think are nothing like, alike each other are completely alike. It's all about which elements people really key on. So the game is also going to focus on procedural or dynamic terrain, randomized terrain, however you like to put that. How would you put that, I guess? Uh, yeah, I guess I'd just call it generated. Um, mm -hmm. gen generated is the, is the word I use for that, generated terrain. Yeah. And how does this really affect the decisions that I'm making in the field? In the level that you've shown, sort of atop a skyscraper, there's sort of these box-shaped obstacles in the way. Is it really just kind of affecting, you know, can I, can I use it for cover? Can I leap over this, th these objects? Or Well, it's, it's very fundamental to the play. And actually, the trailer we put out kind of de-emphasized the terrain a little bit because we just wanted to show sort of the, general, the general feeling and the general mechanics. Um, and most generated levels have actually sort of more terrain than that. Um, and it's really crucial to how you play the game. You need to look at not only where the terrain is created, but also where your, your players and where your opponent's players start out. And there are features on the field uh, field goal zones, bonus zones that you can get extra points for controlling or running through with the ball, that kind of thing. Um, it's all about basically, can I find a, an area of the field that I can control? Um, if you look at games like, like Go and Chess, they are about having a general territory which you then decide to control certain elements of. And Frozen Enzone is exactly the same. Um, so I can choose to try and control any part of the field, and I'll be successful if I do it effectively and if my opponent maybe doesn't sort of pay that much attention to that area of the field. But I would say um, that whenever you start a new match of Frozen End Zone, it is completely different. Um, I've said it before, the thing I love about card games like poker and bridge is that as soon as you pick up a new hand, it's different straight away. And I really hate games where it takes half an hour before you see something different. So that's why we use generated terrain. And every game we make will have like those fundamental differences from the start. Well, you guys are sort of putting a focus on short form gameplay, which I find interesting. I mean, sports in general, of course, are, you know, it's, it's a repetition, there's lots of chances. But do you guys like the idea of sort of maybe most matches in Endzone being five minutes long? Is that That's right. right. Um, I mean, I think that it's something, it's also the same as true of pinball, again, of these card games. If I really want to have a session of poker, I can play two hours of poker. You and me, we can, we can have like 10 beers and play poker the whole evening. Or we can be waiting for the bus and we can play one hand of poker. Uh, I hate being trapped into a two hour game or something. That's the last thing I want. I want to be able to do something and if I'm enjoying it, to keep doing it, if I'm not, to stop doing it. So again, that is really fundamental. And a lot of people would say that Frozen Synapse was startlingly short form and Frozen Enzone is even shorter form. But it's got to be meaningful as well. You've got to be making meaningful, meaningful choices, creative choices, and it's got to be different and interesting every single time. Back to the terrain for a moment. Um, the, the skyscraper scene, again, shown in the trailer, is that probably going to be the only playing area and it's just going to be randomized? Um, no, we'll have, uh, when we launch our pre-order beta, which is what we're planning on doing, there'll be, I think, two stadiums uh, and two different teams. Um, and then when we release, we would expect to have several more, uh, maybe four or five, um, and then we'd expect to expand on that. Uh, we'd really like to um, maybe get sort of some different uh, things in there, like maybe get some other indie games that we're friends with to have like a, a team. Um, like maybe uh, you could have the Spelunky team or something. I, mm. I mean, I haven't talked to Derek about that, that kind of thing. We'd really like to um, have some more other areas go into it. But yeah, it's, that's just the, the thing that we've been working on that looks really good, basically. The one the, great. Uh, one of the other differences, I think fundamentally, between the campaigns, and you are talking about a, a single player campaign for Endzone, is this idea of, you know, in, in Synapse, your soldiers were pretty disposable. I mean, from, from level to level. But there's, is there going to be sort of a potential for you to grow attached to one of your robots to Absolutely. have a favorite guy and like develop him over time throughout the campaign? Definitely. I mean, I think uh, I would say it would be a little bit akin to when I was playing Worms 15 years ago. Um, even though your worms die, you always have the same group of worms. You, you sort of you set them up with their names and you, you have little backstories for them. Well, I, I certainly did. 
Um, so your team will have five guys on them. And I would imagine that generally you would always have the same names when you play you know, over and over again. But each time you play, you'd be leveling them up again. Um, in, in the shorter form version, we want to have a, a campaign mode that kind of takes half an hour to play. Um, and that you, lots of different things can happen. Um, that's kind of where we want to go um, with the roguelike sort of leanings of, of the main shorter form campaign. And we'll probably have a longer form one as well for like playing several seasons, like having sort of a commissioner mode. But definitely the thing that we're really passionate about is making a really interesting progression that happens quite quickly. So let's talk about those roguelike elements. Um, you know, you, you referenced FTL, another, another interview that you did about the game. Um, a lot of people are just immediately curious, how, you know, how do, they, how do you guys see those elements combining with a sports in a strategy game? Right, um, yeah, I think FTL is, um, is a good example because it shows people how you can have a sort of a set of stages which are largely the same kind of idea but have a lot of different things affecting them at every different time. Um, but what I just love about roguelikes, and I think I, I even find pinball to be a roguelike game. Mm -hmm. um, it has permadeath. It tends to become different quite quickly, although that's the, the weakest aspect of it. Um, I don't think it's going to be difficult. I don't think it is difficult um, to make. If you have a game like Frozen Ends and a Frozen Science, which is very good to play single matches of, you have to then find the aesthetic structure and ways of leveling up your people and random things that can happen. Um, I think it's quite natural, to be honest. And actually, I think, you know, I think you've seen some kind of things in the past with that. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm hoping to make something that people are surprised by, but I think it's going to work really well. So Ian, you're the lead designer and the lead programmer in the project, um, but you also have a small t group of uh, guys helping you out. What is it like, and what does it take to make an indie game with eight guys? So um, Frozen Synapse, we had three sort of primary people and then a couple more people who are kind of like part-time uh, contractors. And I mean, the thing that everyone says is that you have to do everything. You have to wear a lot of hats. Um, we have to be producers, programmers, designers. Um, with a team of eight, I'm beginning to find that we actually have kind of able to specialize. We have um, our lead artist is uh, Rich Whitelock, who was, uh, used to be the lead artist at Rebellion. Uh, he's an uh, industry veteran. He's exceptional. Our lead animator is Martin Binfield, who worked at Sony on uh, Heavenly Sword, and that kind of thing. So because we were successful with Frozen Synapse, we're able to afford to attract um, these really, really great, talented people beyond our core team. Uh, I think a lot of indie teams start out with a couple of very talented people, um, and they have to work really hard on the first game. And then maybe if you have a success, then you can get a couple more people on board. So the thing I feel mostly about Frozen Endzone is just it's such a luxury uh, to be able to have really, really talented people um, who are really invested in working on it. Um, so eight people, I think, is, is a reasonable size. And I, I kind of often think a lot of game development has too many people. But back when it was three people, it's just, it's just a rush to do everything. You can't do everything you want to do, and you end up sort of killing yourself, and you have to drink a lot to get out of it. <laughs> I'm curious if you guys have, have any plan to sort of court the, the American football fan that maybe doesn't like strategy games. He's probably a gamer. Um, do you think that's possible with Um Yeah, I think it is possible. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge NFL fan myself, and I see a lot of people. I, I quite like the family aspect. I do, I do hope that people will like a game that does not have any implicit human violence in it. Uh, I would really like there to be some fathers who like Frozen Synapse, who are happy to play Frozen Endzone with their son, because there's no blood, there's no gore. You have some sort of very silly hits, but it's just robots, you know. Um, so I'm kind of attracted by that idea. And obviously, NFL football is super mainstream, and indie games are super non-mainstream. Um, but <coughs> I feel that a lot of people will see the cool stylistic stuff we're doing. Like we, we, there's a lot of references to quite obscure NFL storylines in what we're doing and everything. But time will tell. The, the people we really need to convince are the people who like Frozen Synapse, I think. So as an NFL fan, what's your favorite team, first of all? I support the uh, Atlanta Falcons um, for no particularly good reason. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. And w w what would you say are some of those storylines that you'd like to see? I mean, the coaches are a big part of the, the NFL, of course. Their personality is the re most recent Super Bowl. We had two brothers competing. That's right. Um, so yeah, what, what would you identify as some storylines you'd like to sort of see creep into your game? Uh, one of my favorite storylines is when uh, Mike Martz uh, was in hospital. Uh, I think he had a heart condition. 
and he was actually watching the, the Rams game. He was the Rams head coach. And he actually started calling in plays, uh, trying to get them to run plays. And the, uh, the guys who, uh, who ran the Rams were kind of bored of him by then. They were about to fire him anyway. And they just wouldn't, wouldn't let him through. So I think near the start of the game, we're going to have a storyline along those lines where uh, you're taking over from a coach <laughs> who's had to go to hospital and then he starts calling in sort of, go deep plays, that kind of thing. I, I really enjoy the, um, a lot of the gambling subtext. Gambling is such an interesting uh, mm. thing in America because a lot of people seem to like it, but obviously it's illegal in a lot of places. In England, gambling is legal everywhere. Um, and it's not so much anywhere near so much of a complicated sort of social thing. But I think a lot of people like hearing about gambling even if they don't do the gambling. So we're going to have sort of uh, a whole gambling subculture as part of the aesthetic. And you see people putting up gambling lines and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's just a hugely rich um, sort of tapestry of stuff going on in the NFL that it's fun to, to put in a slightly different context, I think. And I think and a lot of people, um, We've had some people saying that they love Frozen Synapse, but they don't like sports. They don't like real life sports. Uh, and I understand that because I don't like a lot of real life sports. I just happen to like the NFL a lot. Um, I think that those people will see a lot of the stuff that they're missing by not sort of following real life sports in this, in this environment. Or I, I like to hope, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of value there, which a lot of people don't see. How do you feel about you know, marketing and preparing to release and developing Endzone in, a, in an era where strategy games arguably aren't at their strongest? Well, I mean, we heard that message so much more strongly before Frozen mm -hmm. Synapse, and people were saying, you're, you're, you're an idiot, you know, nothing's going to happen, you should make a platform game. Um, I just think that indie games players right now will buy anything that's highly rated and that they're willing to experiment. Um, we're in this amazing phase where people are much more intelligent as consumers of games. And they don't say, oh, I'm only going to play genre X, like an FPS. If they see a, an indie game get 9 out of 10 somewhere, they will, they will go and try it. Um, so that just allows us to be more creative. So you guys released Synapse in 2011. Uh, yes, that's right. And I'm, I'm curious, from your perspective right now, if you know, just how the industry has changed from an indie developer's perspective. Has it become harder to release a game? Has it become easier in some ways? You guys are going through green light now for the first time on Steam. Uh, so in the last two years since, uh, since sign-ups? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a good question because obviously we, we haven't released a game uh, in that time. We've released the add-on for Frozen Synapse. But I would say it's probably easier. I think it's still getting easier. Um, the competition is, getting, it is, is sort of exponentially increasing. Um, and as you can see from the difference between the art quality on Frozen Synapse and Frozen Endzone, we're really stepping it up. A lot of other people are stepping it up. Um, people are seeing Steam as the really profitable platform it is. So a lot of big publishers are moving into the Steam space, whereas maybe three years ago they would have said that PC gaming was dead. Um, having said that, I feel like the bandwidth for people to hear about games and to talk about games is increasing at about the same rates, and the market's increasing as well. So I would say it's probably easier. I think Greenlight um, is going to make it easier for that game you haven't heard of to be published on Steam. Um, if you can run a successful pre-order beta and start getting some word of mouth, then people will start voting for you on Greenlight, and Valve are more than happy to put you on Steam. I think the thing that makes Valve most uncomfortable is having to curate everything. They don't want to be the people saying no. Um, they really don't enjoy doing that. But obviously, there are so many people that want to be on Steam, they have to say no sometimes. I think they want to use Greenlight to stop them making mistakes, most of all. It's also potentially a, a good marketing tool for you guys. I mean, you don't have to rely on people just going to your website or just going to us. You, right. you, get, you get some amount of discoverability on Steam itself, which is a huge enterprise. Yeah, uh, and people, um, Something that I've seen from the Kickstarter phenomenon is it looks like people just genuinely want to be involved in the process of making games, even if that's only at this kind of mini investor level. I see people giving $50 to a Kickstarter they really believe in, and they really feel like they are invested, and they are actually part of that whole game making process. And I think Greenlight is just like that. It doesn't have money involved, but when, but I can see these people and they're saying, well, my time is important, my vote is important, I've read all about the, all these different games, and I'm going to vote for your one. Um, so you actually get these people to become super more invested straight up, and then they want their friends to, to greenlight you as well. And um, yeah, it's, it's a whole different community. And I feel like it's more like Kickstarter than maybe it appears on the, on the surface, like the good elements of Kickstarter. 
you guys, of course, have opted to skip Kickstarter or skip any form of crowdfunding. I, I guess you actually are going to be pursuing sort of a pre-order plan into the, the multiplayer beta or alpha? Yeah, we're going to do almost exactly the same thing we did with Broken Synapse, which mm -hmm. is that we made a multiplayer game we were proud of and we felt would actually sort of stand up on its own and then released that as the pre-order beta. So we really love the pre-order beta process because it allows people to give us real feedback, get involved, and obviously it gets us some income so we can continue working on the game. Um, on the other hand, we, I would say the difference between a pre-order alpha and a pre-order beta, a pre-order beta should be a much more polished thing already. It should be something that you're actually happy to play, not something that's a little bit like sandboxy and you're seeing at the very earliest stages of development. So um, that works for a lot of people, but we really like, we want to sort of, we, we want to impress you at all stages, like we want to impress you with the trailer and we want to impress you with the beta. So when you play our beta, I think people, just like they were with the original Frozen Science one, should be happy with it. That's like our approach. So Kickstarter <coughs> actually, you know, it is kind of one of the things that's emerged since 2011, since that's you right. guys released Frozen Synapse. With that in mind, you know, why did you guys opt to skip it? It's arguably a chance to do things on, on a greater scale, I think some, some studios would say. Uh, yeah, I think there are several reasons. I, the, the very first was, was purely emotional, and I personally felt a little uncomfortable sort of going out with my sort of cap in hand after everyone had supported us to such an extreme level with Frozen Synapse. I feel like when you make an indie game and it's very popular and people talk about it and invest in you. I feel like they're doing a lot of investing in you. They're really helping you out. And then to come back and say, well, you guys helped us have a massive success with the first game, and now we're going to ask you for more money before you've even seen the next game. I just didn't feel particularly com comfortable doing that. Um, we're in the position where, because we were successful, we're able to afford to do at least this stage of development without having to kickstart. And then there are other elements as well. I mean, it's obviously a, a risk with Kickstarter. Um, you may not get there. Um, also. You have to work extremely hard to successfully kickstart. Um, the month during the Kickstarter, any developer will tell you they cannot do anything else. Um, certainly, if you're going to run a successful one, you absolutely have to spend the entire time working on it. And that takes focus away from the game. And then finally, you have a real responsibility to these people who kickstarted you based on a pitch. If you find out that it's the right thing to do to change the game design, to change the pitch document halfway through development, you now have to deal with the fact that that's changing what people invested into. And we've seen that with Ron Gilbert leaving Double Fine. And at no point, I believe in their Kickstarter, did they really say that Ron Gilbert would be involved in the process. But you see, you've got a lot more oversight from people straight on. So for us, if we can afford to do the beta first, we will. So I like what you bring up there at the end, this notion of like being beholden to a set of consumers that they're sort of investors. I mean, they are like sort of player investors you could say that definitely emerged through Minecraft, where you saw a lot of people you know, making a lot of suggestions to Mojang about, we want this feature, we want that feature, we've already given you our money. These are expectations, but you like the idea of sort of being freed from that in terms of just designing the game that you want. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, specifically with Minecraft, I guess they still were sort of pre-ordering the alpha to a certain extent. Yeah, there was all of that drama about when was Minecraft finished. Um, yeah, and we, I, I don't, I don't think anyone sort of enjoys being being beholden. You know, the whole idea of pe things like Kickstarter is that we don't have to have decisions made for us by a publisher. And I think the majority of people who use Kickstarter are really extremely reasonable and understand that they're investing in a team, you know, not just a pitch, and they, they trust people to do it properly. Um, but still, some of the things that concern me about Kickstarter, especially stretch goals, I've seen people get into real trouble by offering these, these unusual stretch goals when they're on the initial high of having made their Kickstarter, which then become real problems later on in development. And honestly, it would be better to just cut them, especially with a stretch goal. They do not really have the freedom to do that. Um, so there's just a lot of danger. And I think that, funnily enough, I almost feel like Kickstarter is more important for the bigger budget games. Mm. Um, the games like the new Ultima, uh, the Richard Garriott project, like the Double Fine stuff, Games which need a big budget and might not be able to get publisher support. A lot of people feel resentful of those projects and feel like those are against the Kickstarter way, but I almost feel like those are exactly the projects which most benefit from Kickstarter. And maybe pre-order beta is something that works as well for indie games. Um, something like Prison Architect, which has managed to take a really Kickstarter-y approach to its pre-order and has made a million dollars. You know, mm -hmm. So I think... So there are lots of different options. I don't think you have to use Kickstarter. I think people get really blinded by the numbers they see and don't see the problems involved. 
Great. Thanks for talking with us today, Ian. Thank you, Evan. Yeah. If people want to learn more about Frozen End Zone, where should they look? Uh, we'd like you to go to frozenendzone.com, and we'd love you to vote for us on Greenlight if you can. All right. Steam Greenlight and frozenendzone.com. Thank you.